What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel and welcome my friends to the first episode of Ancestry Anthology. Since Black Dragon Gaming started, we've been all about the races, the ancestries, the classes, the weird combinations that are not often illustrated in the limelight of TTRPGs because I think they're super interesting. And of course, as we move to second edition, we will do the same today. We are cracking open our Lost Omens character guide to talk about the one I'm playing in Age of Ashes. Today, it's all about the Aruxi. If you're liking what you're seeing, friends, remember, like, subscribe, ding that bell. Stay caught up on all your one and 2 -y stuff. Today, this episode of Ancestry Anthology was brought to you in part by Tkisri, the Artificer, Artificer, Arta, the Crafting Thing. Thank you for teaching me what screen snip is, Tiki. I now know how to do my job much more efficiently. <laughs> I'm a professional. And also thanks for being around. Your friendship is important and I appreciate you. Now here we go. Okay, so lizard folk have been around for a long time. Follow this card right up here. You can catch up on our old, old Pathfinder first edition video on the lizard folk, which will have more of their history in TTRPGs at large. Today, we're just gonna look at them through the lens of Tui. At large, the Aruxi are known as Lizard Folk. In the Lost Omens character guide, they are called Lizard Folk. I will be referring to them as Aruxi because I feel like that does about the same service as calling us hairless apes, right? That's not a sentient race, that's lizard people. And it shoehorns them into a place that I don't really like. The Aruxi have well-deserved reputations and they've adapted to many different environments, but many of them still prefer to remain near bodies of water using their ability to hold their breath to their advantage. These guys are consummate survivors and they've been around, like we said before, since before Earthfall and kind of like the crocodile, they haven't evolved, they haven't changed. They are great at doing what they do. The Aruxi are raised communally from the moment they hatch from their shells. They have an oral tradition stretching back thousands of years. They're passionate astrologers, actually one of the first cultures to ever chart the stars, with one eye on the future and if it's ever said that an Aruxi is slow to act, it's because their long history, and long age truly, has taught them the value of patience. The simple villages that most outsiders will associate with Eruxi are the homes of migrants in outlying regions as truly the Eruxi do have their own settlements which are often overlooked because they're usually, at least partially, in some cases mostly, submerged. These glass and stone complexes bear the mark of every generation of Eruxi who has lived within them and Aruxi bones often adorn the walls, as many Aruxi believe these remains can be animated by ancestral spirits when the residents are in danger. Huh, <laughs> I'll bear that in mind, that's cool. Most Aruxi are unconcerned with the heavy questions of morality, but religion does in fact play a large role in their culture, usually a blend of animism, ancestor worship, druidic rites. Some Aruxi might pray to Gazra, certain demon lords, draconic deities, so on and so forth. On Galarian, within Avistan, most lizard folk dwell in camouflaged ring forts organized into loose confederacies common in think like the River Kingdoms or the Mushfens of Verizia. Most of the Aruxi in the Sodden lands along Garoon's eastern coast have fallen under the sway of a faction known as the Turwa Lords, militaristic warrior kings and shamans whose rise has pressed other Aruxi and their Lirgeni human neighbors east away from the rising military state, but the biggest Eruxi settlement is Droon, a vast empire of dinosaur riders which exists in southern Garoon. Now, let's take a look at their racial stuff. So far as their height and weight and max age, we're gonna run this a little different as it is presented different in second edition, physical adulthood at age 15, and live up to 120 years. Most lizard folks stand anywhere from six to seven feet tall, so that's 1.8, to 2.1 meters. Thing is, lizard folk grow throughout their lifetime and they gain both strength and size with age. So that's super interesting to me. That's That takes the notion of playing the older character and flips it on its head, deal. Do we know how much they weigh? No, no we don't. But I think that'll vary from Eruxi to Eruxi. In any case, an Eruxi receives eight hit points from its ancestry. It is a medium creature with a base speed of 20 feet its ability boosts are to strength and wisdom, with one free, with a flaw to intelligence. I don't necessarily subscribe to these, but an Eruxi begins play speaking common Eruxi 
and additional languages with which you might have access equal to your intelligence. I do like that better than it used to be in 1E with that very small list that you could choose from. They have the lizard folk and humanoid traits as well as claws, specifically a claw unarmed attack that deals 1d4 slashing damage with the agile and finesse traits. They also gain the breath control general feat as a bonus feat via aquatic adaptation. For the current heritages, the cliff scale lizard folk, the one I'll be playing, has toes that are adapted for gripping and climbing. In the case of mine, I just wanted a big old dew claw like a Deinonychus. This gives you the combat climber feat as a bonus feat, and as long as you aren't wearing footwear, you can use the sticky pads on your feet to climb, leaving your hands free. If you roll a success on athletics to climb, it's a critical success instead. The frilled lizard folk can flare its neck frill and flex its dorsal spines, demoralizing its foes. When it does, demoralize loses the auditory trait and gains the visual trait and does not take a penalty when attempting to demoralize a creature that doesn't understand it. This also gives it the threatening approach action. For two actions, you stride to be adjacent to a foe and demoralize that foe. If you succeed, the foe is frightened two instead of frightened one. Not bad. Sand Strider lizard folk have thick scales to help it retain water and combat the sun's glare, giving it fire resistance equal to half its level. Environmental heat effects are one step less extreme, and you can go 10 times as long as normal before you are affected by starvation or thirst. However, unless you wear protective gear or take shelter, environmental cold effects are one step more extreme for you. And there's that cold-blooded thing we've always wondered about. The unseen lizard folk, the chameleon, can change its skin color to blend in with surroundings, making minor shifts with a single action and dramatic changes over the course of an hour. When you're in an area where your coloration is roughly similar to the environment, you can use the minor single action application of this ability for a plus two circumstance to stealth. Not bad. I'm gonna say that a lot. A lot of these are not bad. Wetlander lizard folk gets a 15 foot swim speed now. Ancestry feats. Lizard folk lore gets you the trained proficiency rank in nature and survival. If you would automatically become trained in one of these, you become trained in a freebie and you get a Ruxi lore. Parthenogenic hatchling, you being hatched from an unfertilized egg, and being a biological copy of your mother gives you a plus one circumstance bonus to saves against disease. Each of your successful saves against a disease reduces its stage by two or by one for a virulent disease, crits are three or two. You take damage only every two hours from thirst and only every two days from starvation rather than every hour and every day. You can only take this at first level. Are there any herpetologists I think that's the term for reptile scientists in the audience. Can anyone confirm that that is why parthenogenic reptiles exist? Because hard times? I'm very curious. Razor claws at feet level one. Ups your punch into a d6 that can also do piercing. A reptile speaker, one of the ones Maya Ruxi will be taking, lets you ask questions of, receive answers from, and use diplomacy with animals that are reptiles. I'll also take sharp fangs for a fangs unarmed attack that deals 1d8 piercing damage. More on that in a little while. Marsh Runner, when you have that swim speed, says when you use the step action, you can ignore difficult terrain caused by flooding, swamps, or quicksand. Oh, there you go. You still out there, Justin? Wouldn't that have looked really good on a, a certain rogue in a certain doomsday dawn? Hmm. In addition, when you use the acrobatic skill to balance on narrow surfaces or uneven marshy ground, you aren't flat-footed. And if you roll a success on the acrobatics check, it's a crit instead. And Tail Whip was the one I was excited for, but I'm a little just meh about because the tail unarmed attack only does 1d6 bludgeoning. Sure, it has the sweep trait, but I think I just like the one that hits harder. At fifth level, in Venom Fangs, with sharp fangs as a prereq, a number of times per day equal to your level, you envenom your fangs. If the next fang strike you make before the end of your next turn hits and deals damage, the strike deals an additional d6 poison damage. On a crit fail, the poison is wasted as normal. Gecko's Grip, another feat I like so much that I took Ancestral Paragon, gives you a climb speed of 15 feet with just your feats. Feels good. Eruxia Unarmed Cunning would give you the critical specialization effects from your bites, your claws, your tails, and things. Of course, shed tail, as we discussed before, when you become grabbed, if you have a fully grown tail, you cease being grabbed by popping your tail off, then you stride without triggering any reactions from the creature that grabbed you. It takes a week for your tail to grow back. A no tail unarmed attacks and a minus two circumstance penalty on checks to balance until then. Swift Swimmer lets you swim as fast as you can stride. Terrain advantage at ninth level. 
one I'm liking quite a bit and probably will take as my ninth level feat. You can take advantage of the terrain to bypass foe's defenses. Non-lizard folk creatures in difficult terrain are flat-footed to you. If you have a swim speed, non-lizard folk creatures that are in water and lack a swim speed are also flat-footed to you. Not bad when one half of your gestalt combo is druid and you can just drop an entangle and you can just cast a spell to make the ground difficult terrain. Oops, it's easier for my snick and I, oh by the way, I can talk to my snick to hit you. At 13th level, last but not least, Iruxi Unarmed Expertise says that whenever you gain a class feature that grants you expert or greater proficiency in certain weapons, you also gain that proficiency in the claw and unarmed attacks you gain from Blizzard Folk Ancestry feats. Now, I'm gonna play an Iruxi in second edition. Let me tell you about him real quick, because I'm really excited. I couldn't decide on a name that both fit the flavor and would be easy for my GM to pronounce, so I just kind of defaulted to Magic the Gathering, as I often do, because it fits the flavor for what I'm doing with him, and I'm going to, in fact, call him, named after this snick boy here, Ronos the Indomitable, a gestalt champion druid that will be my book two of Age of Ashes. His people have been around for a long time, and the character is from Garund, for plot reasons, so it stands to reason to me that there's probably at least one Eruxi culture out there that was exposed to the gods of ancient Osirion, carrying that line of worship down for thousands of years. My champion of the deity will be brewing up by kind of patron request, because Ross told me I should do it. The next episode of Wednesday Afternoon Worship, Wadjet, he spent his life protecting those that travel the River Sphinx, eventually coming into contact with a plot-relevant NPC, and then being put into the events of Age of Ashes, Mechanically speaking, that D8 bite is really cool with Everstand stance. Being able to hold a shield in two hands to increase its hardness. Sure, a D8's not a D10, it's not a D12, but it's still pretty good. More than acceptable in return for raising the hardness of a shield that my spirit will go into and can just block forever. Again, I really wish it would have been the tail. I also like the flavor, though, of casting Magic Fang on myself, and then my head kind of cobras out a little to look like a Uraeus, and then striking forward and biting someone, which might mean I take in Venom Fangs eventually. I don't know. We'll see. Playing in a Rooksy means you can get access to a lot of alternate speeds, which can be really huge. A climb speed means you can be standing in the door with someone else who is standing in the door as, like, you look down on the grid at the table, but in reality, you're standing on the top of the door frame, still able to block with a shield, maybe outside of the reach of people so you're not provoking reactions as you're casting down, but still having full line of sight into the room. That's huge. The ability to hold your breath really long for free in an aquatic game obviously has its own major, major benefits, to say nothing of like gas and stuff. And a swim speed in a world where people might not necessarily be able to swim means you're moving really fast, able to move in the encounter a little easier. The advantages stack upon themselves, especially if you can just make somebody flat-footed to you. I also really like that in second edition, again, the Aruxi are a more codified thing than just like, here are tribes of lizard people. They get into conflict with people without scales. Doesn't really make them feel like a humanoid culture, right? When we say that they have a rich oral tradition and they've been around since before the Age of Darkness, they were one of the first cultures to learn how astrology works, they believe their ancestors will come back and defend them, but also they have vast cities far from the eye of the rest of the humanoid world. It makes them feel a little more real to me. Truly, I hope we get a splat book or an adventure that takes place in Droon. What more do you want than a city full of things that haven't needed to evolve since the dinosaurs riding dinosaurs? It sounds fun to me, but what do y'all think? Are we playing Aruxi in 2nd edition? Did you play him in 1st edition? What would you add as later ancestry feats? Throw it in the comments. Next week, either the Hobgoblin or the Leshy. I'm not sure which, one or the other, but we'll see you next Monday.